All right. Quick review. How comprehensive are the decrees of God according to the confession? Absolutely. Totally. Whatsoever. That's uh, it's one of our favorite words. Whatsoever comes to pass is the language of the catechisms and the confession. In the decree of election, God works efficiently. In the decree of reprobation, he works permissively. passively or permissively, passing over. Do those words mean the same thing? Or are they nuanced? No, they're, they're nuanced, yeah. Let it, letting things go as opposed to, you know, permission. Permission is more of an active sense of, of letting go. The other is a more passive sense of letting things go. I would say there's, you know, a nuanced difference. But it, essentially, this, you get in the same place. Excuse me? Not a bare permission. Right. So we're going to get to that today. Yes. Um, distinguish infralapsarianism from superlapsarianism, which allows you to say that God chooses to save some from out of the mass of fallen humanity and others he passes by. Well, fallen is the key word, out of the fallen. So it has to have happened after the fall, yeah. whereas the other one it happens first. Right. So uh, with, uh, yeah, you all tweak the order uh, here. Um, so, so with uh, superlapsarian, you start with election. And with infralapsarian, you start with creation. And this, uh, and, th and that then sets in order the differences between uh, the two points of view. Um, election, what comes next in the uh, superlapsarian scheme? Creation. Election, creation, and fall. 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 Redemption. Re redemption. In the uh, infralapsarian? All right, what uh, practical difference does the doctrine of God's eternal and unchanging decree make? In other words, relate the decrees of God to some practical effects that believing in them has. Assurance of salvation. Right, the confession of, uh, applies it to assurance. Worship. Worship. Humility. Humility. Any others? Complete trust. Hmm? Trust. Trust, confidence, yeah. Uh, what are the decrees of God? The decrees of God are his eternal purpose according to the counsel of his will, whereby for his own glory he has foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. It just rolls off the tongue. The decrees of God are his eternal purpose according to the counsel of his will, whereby for his own glory he has foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. Okay, so we move on to the next uh, section uh, of creation. And uh, let's look at the two uh, sections on this. It pleased God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost for the manifestation of the glory of his eternal power, wisdom, and goodness. You see how these three come up? Um, it's not the first time we have encountered them. Uh, but um, uh, back in chapter one, talking about what natural, what we can know by about God through nature, as opposed to not, you know natural revelation, as opposed to scriptural revelation. What can we know? We can know of the power, wisdom, and goodness of God, just by looking at the creation. So it pleased um, God uh, for the manifestation of His power, wisdom, and goodness. I sing the almighty power of God. That Isaac Watts hymn. Uh, highlights those three characteristics as it celebrates creation. Uh, we sang that a couple of Sunday nights, uh, Sunday mornings ago. In the beginning to create or make of nothing, okay, the Latin phrase there is ex nihilo. Uh, that is uh, the Christian doctrine is that God doesn't give shape to pre-existing or eternally existing material. He creates ex nihilo. He creates out of nothing. Uh, he brings into being that which did not exist. Um, to create or make of nothing the world and, and all things therein, whether visible or, or invisible, in the space of six days and all very good. So a couple of uh, scripture texts to that end. Psalm 33, 
uh, verses 6, 8, and 9, by the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts, let all the earth fear the Lord, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him, for he spoke and it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm. One of the old, older versions, he, he spoke and it was done. He said, let there be and there was. So how powerful is God's word? Well, he just, he just speaks the universe into existence. And uh, Isaiah 40, um, I think, is a, is a particularly um, powerful um, um, celebration of that uh, in, in that the, there, there the question is being sort of asked, how did he do this? Who were his counselors? Uh, after all, he measured out the waters in the hollow of his hand. He, wear, he weighed the mountains and, on a scale and the hills in a balance. So all of the vastness that we see, it, how, how did he do all that? The span, right, the hev yeah, the heaven, he measures by his span. You know, the span is from the thumb to the finger, the, the point of the finger. This is, this is the, the immensity of God. Uh, considered in light of the immensity of the creation, the immensity of the universe gives us some grasp of the immensity, the infinite nature of God. Um, Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, and so what is seen was not made of things that are visible. All right, so he creates uh, ex nihilo, uh, Then the paragraph number two, after God had made all other creatures, he created man, male, and female with reasonable and mortal souls and do with knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness after his own image, having the law of God written in their hearts and power to fulfill it, and yet under a possibility of transgressing, being left to the freedom of their own will. Hold, we'll stop there. Um, let's go on to the questions, uh, why did God create the world? For his glory. Right, for his, for his own glory. Uh, for the manifestation of the glory of his eternal power, wisdom, and goodness. Uh, so wh when and out of what did he create? <laughs> out of nothing, ex nihilo. How do you reconcile this with modern science? Eh. <laughs> and science speaks more than it knows. Yeah. Um, um, where do you start to answer that question? How do you reconcile? I think sometimes science throw uh, sends us back to scripture to make sure that we've wrought properly in, uh, interpreted it. Uh, Dr. Packer made that point about um, the you know the environmental environmentalist movement in the 1970s uh, led to some renewed discussion among Christians of Christian stewardship of the of the environment, uh, which was a worthwhile discussion. Um, something short of of uh, turning uh, environmentalism into a religion, as as uh, you know not. Uh, just a few people have done in our day, but, but not to go that at extreme, but there is the idea of Christian stewardship from Genesis 1 and 2. You know, God sets he, humanity into the, into, on the earth to cultivate the fields and develop, develop the resources of, uh, of earth and bring honor and glory to God by doing that. So we sometimes we, do, we are forced back to look at our own Bibles and to evaluate things, um, but I do think that we're not going to science to find out what the Bible means or what it must mean because of the assured results of science. So I think our primary task is to understand the text. What does the Bible require us to believe? What does it teach? What does it mean by what, uh, by what it says? Um, and we evaluate science on the basis of scripture, not scripture on the basis of science. In other words, we don't, we don't change our interpretation because of science. Uh, we look and, and come to a, a, a satisfactory understanding of what the Bible teaches, and then we uh, go and look and see how science can fit in with Scripture. So the authority for us is going to be Scripture. It's not going to be science. Terry, yes. Terry one other point is that I, I guess I would make is that the, the doctrine of creation in Scripture actually gives us the only real foundation for scientific inquiry to begin with because it, it supposes... It gives us an ordered universe from an ordered God 
And so whatever foundation that the you know, modern science as, a, as an institution has for scientific inquiry, they're only leaning on the, the ideas of a Christian, of a historic Christian West of the ordered universe that allows for that kind of inquiry to take place. Um, yes, and uh, secular um, philosophers have made that point. It's like the Tom Holland point about human rights coming out of Christianity, but in the scientific realm, it's the same, same sort of thing. Uh, right, and who is it? Um, uh, his name is escaping me at, at the moment. You know, Whitehead? Yes, White, Whitehead, Lord White. Alfred, Alfred North. Wolf, yeah, Alfred North Whitehead. You know, he made that same argument, uh, which was that uh, you know, modern science, science did not develop beyond where it developed in the ancient world because there wasn't that confidence in an ordered universe. It was Christians who believe in an ordered universe who um, were confident that you know, scientific experimentation could be repeated because the world is a reliable place. That God set up laws, natural laws, so you could, you could calculate things in a reliable and in a dependable way. And no one, apart from Christianity, has ever had that confidence. Yes? I mean, as somebody who studied science in college, I think I mean, once you really look at the cosmologies built around supposedly science, it's just absolute flying leaps that it's like, it takes so much faith to look at you know, some fossils and then invent an entire origin of species on the back of that. Um. Agree. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, I have a note here that says Dr. Kelly believes modern science will have a paradigm shift that will reconcile science to, to the biblical narrative. Have you heard, ever heard him talk about that? Um, yes, uh, at the end of your notes, uh, there's a reference to Kelly's book, Creation and Change. And he does believe, you know, there have been massive paradigm shifts. Um, in the past, uh, the Copern Copernican revolutions, where everything was interpreted in one light, um, and then uh, due to Copernicus, you know, then every, all of the data is reinterpreted to line up with a, a, a uh, heliocentric rather than a geocentric universe. Uh, so all the data was lining up behind the geocentric, and that turned out to be wrong. You know, the solar system is not. Uh, is not geocentric, it's heliocentric. Uh, these planets revolve around the sun and so forth. So all the calculations had to be redone. And he, said he believes there will be a paradigm shift. He's a particularly an advocate for a young, a young Earth. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced that young Earth is, is a necessary belief. And uh, your notes, which I'm sure that you have diligently read, make the point that um, that, uh, that there have been a variety of opinions on that. Going back to the church fathers, for example, Augustine, the greatest of the early, um, the early, uh, pr probably the greatest theologian in the history of the church, believed in uh, that God created in a moment of time, um, instantaneous creation, um, not seven days, but uh, he spoke and it was done. Um, and there's even, there's even reason in the text of Scripture itself. Uh, Genesis 2, 4 speaks of the day in which God created the heavens and the earth. Well, which was it? Was it seven, you know, six days or was it the day? And given the variety of the use of the word yom, um, you know, in, in, in English as well as in Hebrew, the day back in, you know, Roosevelt's day, we say, we talk about days as eras. Uh, so, did God create the world? Yes. Um, there, there's no question about that. Do we believe in the, absolutely in a special creation of the human race? Yes. Um, does that uh, require us to believe in a young earth? Um, so, there's not been a consensus on that. And um, at least John Fesco argues in his book on the Westminster Confession that, that there wasn't there, there wasn't, uh, the, the writers of the confession knew of this history of interpretation and um, they, they were not seeking to overturn the idea that uh, the creation could have taken place in a moment of time uh, back, in the, you know, back in eternity somewhere. Uh, so are we required to believe in a young earth versus an old earth? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, that's disturbing for some people, um, but um, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't. 
for example, the Schofield Reference Bible, the ultimate fundamentalist book, you know, it, it, it speaks of an old earth. It, 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 it wedges creation into the verse 1 of Genesis. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then they, 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 uh, they then wedge billions of years into, in, before the next phrase, and the, and the earth was form, void and formless. Tohu and po whatever that is. Anyway. Uh, do you think that there's a distinction to be made for you, like, between belief versus what you teach as a minister, like from the pulpit or in any context of like, subscribing to the confession? I, 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 I've known pastors who have taken exception and are, are very much older, but they've committed to not teaching that necessarily in their, in their ministry. I'm curious if you have thoughts on making that distinction or what your take is there. I think that that has come up one time in 36 years in a sermon. So I don't think it really comes up. Um, I, I don't think it uh, really makes much difference if you think that God created a billion years ago or God created uh, 6,000 years ago. And I don't feel competent to evaluate the science. Um, I just know that God created. Um, evolution is an entirely different subject in my, in my thinking because I think we, we're being taught that there's a special creation of the animals. And uh, so to, to use an evolutionary methodology, uh, I don't think there's any hint of a, you know, an ev uh, evolving of the species and so forth, and certainly not of human beings evolving out of apes and all of that. I think that's all, I think that's beyond the pale. But young earth, old earth, you know, B.B. Warfield, the great defender of the inerrancy of Scripture, the greatest defender of all time, um, he believed in an old earth. Uh, so I, I think that there are plenty of orthodox people who are willing to accommodate an old earth, uh, but they cannot accommodate the idea that, uh, that uh, the, the world is being uh, created by, you know, evolutionary proceeds. And evolution depends on death, and death before the fall has problems. Say that again? Evolution depends on death. And to have death before the fall, which there would have to be if the non-human non animals were created, evolved before man, they, there had to have been death for them to have evolved. And before man was created, there was no fall. Yeah. Scripture therefore teaches there was no death. Yeah, Mer Mer well, maybe so. Yeah, I, Mer Meredith Klein believes there was animal death before the fall. I, I was more willing to believe in some form of theistic evolution before that was pointed out to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's, I just want you all to be familiar with some of the discussion out there. Um, uh, J.I. Packer subscribes to this. Um, so Meredith Klein is especially associated with this um, Genesis 1 and the framework hypothesis, it's called, is that you have a kind of structure, a, a um, literary structure. If you don't, if, I wouldn't call it a poetic structure per se, but a literary structure in which there are kingdoms and kings. So day one, the kingdoms of the light and darkness are created. And then, uh, then the kings, the sun and the moon and the stars, um, in the, the terms, um, they are to rule over. So there you get the king and kingdoms idea. Um, and, uh, they are to rule the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. Um, uh, God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, to separate the light from the darkness and so forth. Day two, you have water and sky. Day five, you have sea creatures and birds that then fill the, uh, that kingdom. Um, day three, you, uh, you have uh, la dry land and vegetation. And then day six, the beasts of, uh, of the earth and and uh, man, and man is given the command then to have dominion, the day six, dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air. So they, again, the kings 
uh, ruling over kingdoms. And so Klein has, that Meredith Klein, an Old Testament professor at Gordon-Conwell and uh, Westminster Seminary, has, uh, has promoted this, this idea. And like I say, Packer subscribed to it. Uh, others have as well. Um, so that, uh, so that the, you know, the idea that, that uh, this has to be taken as 24-hour days um, is, uh, you know, the argument is that that's not required of the text itself. In other words, what's driving the interpretation here? The, uh, the argument of those who hold to this are saying, we're letting the text of Scripture drive the argument. We see a literary structure here that, that uh, indicates that, and then reinforced by Genesis 2-4, in the day that God created. These are not meant to be literal days. Um, in addition to that, you have the, you have, um, let, let's, uh, let's see. Um, you have, it's this interesting comment, there was evening and there was morning the first day. Now, what's, <coughs> what's interesting about that is that the sun and the moon have not yet been created. So what is the meaning of the word morning and evening when there's no sun and moon? Um, sun, morning and evening are defined by the placement of the earth in relation to the sun and the moon, uh, but they've not been made yet. So again, that, is this meant to be um, a, 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 um, you know, a literal discussion of 24-hour days, or are there elements here that give us hints that, that uh, this, is, this has been uh, written with uh, literary uh, qualities in mind, um, almost poetic, but it, it, to, or put it this way, a poetic account of an historical event, all right, the creation of the world. We're not talking about poetry that's making up something that didn't happen, but that this is a, a way of, uh, with a literary flair, put it that way maybe, uh, describing the fact of God creating the entire universe. Um, okay. Yeah, you don't get till day four that you get the, the sun and the moon. Uh, so, but you still have light and darkness. You do have light and darkness, yes, from the beginning. But you don't have a sun and a moon to provide the moon and the, uh, the light and the darkness. Yeah. My, my question would be where, so how could you say that, oh, this is like literary and poet, poetic, perhaps, and then, okay, now we're going to start taking it literally when we start hearing history of Israel. Well, that's what I'm saying. If you see literary elements and, or poetic elements and non-literal use of words, as in day meaning 24 hours, and evening and morning not being meant the way we use that language, um, so when you see those kinds of elements, then you can take a second look at it as to whether or not this is meant to be a literal description of 24-hour days. That's what I'm saying. I want to be driven by the text uh, I don't want to be driven by the science. I feel personally I am not a scientist and able to evaluate that. I'm not doing the Supreme Court justice thing, I hope, where I can't tell you what a man or a woman is because I'm not a biologist. But I, I think that the arguments for old earth versus new earth are, are, are very sophisticated. I appreciate Doug Kelly who tries to gather up all that evidence and argue for 24-hour days. I think he may be right. On the other hand, um, I think the Schofield Reference Bible, the you know, the handbook of fundamentalism. That may be right, too, that the, the, the earth is old. So, um, you know, when you're getting, when you're getting, um, 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 uh, you're getting geology, the rocks, and you're getting, um, what do you call the study of the stars? Astrology. astrology, and that's lining up. Astronomy. Astronomy, astronomy. not <laughs> astrology. No, we don't, <laughs> that evil, wicked. Uh, not astrology, astronomy. You know, when you're getting several scientific disciplines to line up to indicate, you know, the, tr the distance that light has traveled over time and 
these sorts of things. The creation, the, the, the young earth people argue, and I think it's a pretty clever argument, God created the world fully grown. So Adam and Eve were adults when they were created. They had the appearance of age. Were they, did they have age? No, they were freshly created. They were like one day old, but they were adults. So trees with they have belly buttons. <laughs> 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 they could have. They didn't need to. Um, what, you know what Augustine said to people who ask foolish questions? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I'm going to know in a minute. Yeah, he, was, <laughs> he, he was asked what was God doing uh, before he created the world, and he said he was creating hell for people who ask foolish questions. <laughs> Jim? Not to throw another wrench into this, but are we also are, are we accounting for chronology, the, the age of the, the um, line of Christ going back to Adam, um, because if we do, if we, if we accommodate the idea of age or old earth, then we also have to consider the relativity, relativity of years as well as days, because the years that all of these men lived all the way back to Adam are pretty clearly laid out, so you can count it all the way back to 4004 or whatever it is, BC. Yeah, that's Bishop Buster's chronology. The problem with it is that the genealogies are incomplete. So you compare genealogy with genealogy, there's gaps in them, and so we don't have any assurance that they are complete as they are. Um, how, how, how old is the human race? Maybe Usher's right, I mean, 4000 BC, 4004 BC, I mean, who knows? I just, again, I just don't think this is something we can be dogmatic about. Did God create uh, human beings uh, out, of the, out of the dust of the ground? Yes. Uh, yes. So I don't know if this is the answer, but there's the account of creation in Job, and God says to Job, "Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth?" That that would be an indication that we're not meant to know. But well, that is, yeah. Where were you? How dare you challenge me? Uh, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Um, yeah, you don't you don't have any idea how I did this. Yeah. So. Certainly much about the creation is a mystery to us. But ultimately, we know that uh, it's, it's an act of God that brought the universe into existence. There was no universe in existence, and he brought it into existence. How did he do it? He spoke. He spoke, and it was done. Did he do it in 24-hour in periods, hours being measured by the rotation of the earth in relation to the sun um, and the moon? Um, which don't yet exist, and that God is sitting out there in eternity. Um, I, I just think this, it's, uh, I think it's a very complicated question. It's just beyond me. So did God create in seven days, or did God create in a split second, or did God create, um, and did he do all that like 10,000 years ago, or did he do it uh, a, a billions and billions of years ago? I just, I just am agnostic on that. Knowing that we're studying God's creation, we're studying him. At what point is it not right to put that study to rest? Does that make sense? So I feel like I used to, get, I got hung up on this for the longest time, God's creation, and it conflicts with science in, in every way. Uh, so I feel like I, at some point I just had to put my faith in God and stop studying the science on it. And sometimes I feel guilty because I'm not, I feel like I'm not studying God's creation by doing that. Well, you know, I, I, I some of the most Brilliant scientists who ever lived, a, a good many of them have been very devout Christians. Um, the, you know, I, I really should write into these notes. You know, the, some some of the names of of the um, the key scientists. Um, fr uh, Fritz Schaefer's book that um, um, I have it, I don't have it in here because it's more broadly about science. But uh, uh, conflict and coherence. His book. He goes through. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, you know, Michael Faraday, for example, he was a very devout Christian. Uh, Blaise Pascal, the brilliant mathematician, very devout Christian. Um, on the wall of, of, um, of uh, Einstein's study was the picture of one man, um, Maxwell. What's the first name of Maxwell? Um, any, anyway, he was the most brilliant, brilliant Scottish uh, physicist. Uh, greatly admired of Einstein. He was very. He was a. He was one of us. He was a. He was a free, free Church of Scotland Presbyterian. He believed the Bible cover to cover, 
and uh, brilliant, brilliant scientists. New Newton wrote more on, um, on Christianity than he did on science. Um, today, Fr Francis uh, uh, Fritz, Fritz Schaefer at, uh, at Georgia, Henry F. Schaefer, uh, he is the Graham Purdue Professor of Theoretical Chemistry at the University of Georgia and the director of the Center for Computational Chemistry. He's like the most brilliant computational chemist in the world. He, he invented the field, basically. Basically he did, and the field didn't exist until there were high-speed high computers who could run the calculations that he devised, he and others in the field. And he's been nominated for Nobel Prizes four or five times. He, 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 he studies the building blocks of the universe, and he says about himself when he's studying atoms. And subatomic as well. Yes. These you know, these atomic particles. He is studying God. He is studying the handiwork of God. And he too is an agnostic. Eh, it could be, could be that God uh, did it in an instant. It could be the earth is young, the earth is old. He's indifferent on the, on the subject. But he is a PCA ruling elder, very devout, godly man. He was here um, in Savannah just last week. We had, Emily and I had lunch with him. He comes to this church regularly, you know, a couple of times a year. Um, so, um, so there are plenty of Christians who plunge to the depths of, and are, of science and are brilliant scientists who are creationists in that they believe that God created and believe he didn't create with an evolutionary process, um, and, but still are indifferent on the subject of whether it's a young earth or an old earth. All right, we need to press on. Uh, let's go on to number two. What distinguishes man from the rest of creation? Yeah, the pr primary things are the image of God, righteousness, holiness, dominion over the creatures. Uh, yeah, so, so what uh, separates humanity and is the, at, at the heart of what uh, constitutes the dignity and sanctity of human life is that we alone of all created beings are made in the image of God. That sets human beings apart. That's why we don't treat human beings like, like we do grasshoppers or even like squirrels or dogs or cats or horses. Uh, th there's a um, distinctive sanctity, distinctive dignity uh, of human life um, and is to be respected um, because human beings, whatever their race, wherever their region, their ethnicity, they are made in the image of God and so are due uh, that, uh, that honor and uh, respect. Um, you know, we could, I contrast uh, in the notes somewhere, you know, B.F. Skinner, Beyond, uh, his book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, you know, he's, uh, he's r working from an atheistic point of view and from an atheistic and evolutionary point of view, there is no human dignity and there is no human freedom. You know, we're just, we're just a, you know, a product of our genes. It's either nature or nurture that determines what we are. We really aren't free. We either do what we do because of the environment or we do what we do because of, the, of, our, of our genes. Um, but there is, no, there is no essential dignity to human beings. That's, that's one of the real problems of, of uh, <coughs> modern society today is that we have undermined the basis for human, human dignity. Uh, if we're not made by God, we're just, a, we're just here by chance. Um, we're just a particular form of life. Um, we are more complex than other beings, but why should complexity be um, uh, preferred over simplicity? And some of the, the radical environmentalism, this is exactly what you see. Why should a human being prefer, be preferred over a tree? That's why there were spiking trees in the, in the, in the, in the Northwest and, and uh, maiming and killing uh, lumberjacks uh, in order to save the trees. They, they didn't mind uh, harming human beings, but they were saving, saving the trees because the trees had as much of a right to life as as, as, anything, as anything else. So in the extreme environmentalism, you see some, you see some of this. Um, and then I think with uh, you know, genocidal regimes throughout the world where they, there, there isn't a belief in universal human dignity uh, because um, the, that the image of God is not understood or it's denied. Uh, so, you know, in the Soviet Union, it was um, it was only the peasant class. Uh, even if you were a rich peasant, a kulak, you were expendable. 
you know, there's no sense of the universal human rights and human dignity um, because there isn't this concept of the image of God and bearing that image. Um, in Hitler's Germany, you know, Jews, they, they, they're not seen as bearing uh, the image of God in any kind of special way, and so they're expendable. And, I, you know, it's, uh, in, in China, it, it, if you were, well, if it, in Soviet Union, it, you weren't of the working class. In China, you weren't of the peasant class. Um, Pol Pot in Cambodia, if you weren't, if you had any uh, uh, traces of Western influence, you were expendable. Um, uh, throughout antiquity, this is Tom Holland again, his books, he's demonstrated clearly there's no concept of universal human rights, universal human dignity in the ancient world whatsoever. That's a Christian concept and it's tied directly into the image of God. So if, if, if you are made in the image of God, your life has value. There is a sacredness to the human, human life, there is a dignity to human life. All right, um, and knowledge, righteousness, and holiness were rational beings, yes. About the sanctity of human life, what do the, um, I think the, the Muslims or the, um, yeah, like a lot of those Asian, uh, Eastern religions, don't they have something similar? They're not quite the same thing, but don't they also regard human life as viable as well? Or yeah, I don't think so. No. I think that life is cheap in the East, always has been. Um, so look at the caste system in India, um, the untouchables. Um, they're, they're untouchable and they're expendable. There isn't that, uh, that uh, you know, in the West we develop hospitals. We take care of the sick and the weak. They're expendable in, the, in Eastern thought and in Eastern religions. Um, I, th I think the argument, you know, if you want to pursue the argument that's really well developed, it's in Tom Holland's book, Dominion where he you know, scans the world and scans history and just says, look, it's just not out there. The, the person who is arguing for trans rights and gay rights is beating us over the head with our own weapon. They don't realize that they think like Christians. They think about human rights for the tiniest, tiniest minority because despite their, their avowed dis disavowal of Christianity, they think like Christians. They think like people have rights. People's, the, life, uh, the lives of ordinary people are worthwhile and should be protected and guarded and so forth because it's only been in this uh, you know, Hebrew Christian context that that's been understood and practiced. Um, you can even see it in the military, in military uh, tactics, um, the use of wave tactics. Um, you know, in the Korean War, the Chinese uh, came across the border across the, the Yalu River and attacked um, at the Chosen Reservoir, the, you know, the 1st Marine Division, they would attack in waves and they, did, they, they, they varied the way they attacked in that they would send one wave, the first wave with rifles, the second wave without rifles because they didn't have enough rifles with the idea that the first wave was going to get wiped out. The second wave would pick up the rifles of the first wave. Then they started varying it I forget in which order they did this, but they started varying it and just sending the first wave with no rifles. Second wave got the rifle. Um, so, it, you know, life, was, life is expendable. Um, you know, Eastern Christianity, I don't think, has this same strong view of uh, the image of God and human dignity. And so, si similarly, um, you still see in Russian military tactics today in Ukraine, same stuff they were doing in World War II. They just throw waves of people at the enemy, at the enemy fortifications. In 1945, at the, you know, the last months of the war, they are still losing thousands of tanks and hundreds of thousands of men attacking the um, uh, uh, tiered defenses outside of Berlin. There just is a disregard for the value of human rights. So, all that to say. Um, what distinguishes man were made in the image of God. And that's why in Genesis 9:4 it says um, that, that uh, God made man uh, in his image, in, in the image of God he made him, uh, and, and therefore whoever takes man's life by man, his life shall be shed. So the, it's con almost counterintuitive, but the, the rationale for capital punishment, Genesis 9:4, after the flood, is to restrain human evil. 
How do you restrain it? Well, you put the, you make those who would dare to shed the life of a human being made in the image of God would sacrifice, they would pay the ultimate price, they would, they would lose their own life as a result of the crime. So you put the ultimate penalty on the ultimate crime. Take a human life, that's as bad as it gets. You forfeit your own life if you do it. So what's the point of that? Um, the value of a human being. You're made in the image of God. You don't so wantonly or carelessly uh, sacrifice the life of another human being. Okay, number three, uh, the free will of man is described in 4.2 of what does it consist? The ability to fulfill the law with the possibility of transgressing the law. Yes. Um, So free will is understood by the confession, having law of God written in their hearts and the power to fulfill it and yet under a possibility of transgressing, being left to the freedom of their own will which was subject unto change. Besides this law written in their hearts, uh, they received a command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which while they kept, they were happy in their communion with God and had dominion over the creatures. Uh, so, y yes, um, the law of God written in their hearts, the power to fulfill it, yet under the possibility of transgressing it. So, does it still exist? No, when we get to the chapter on free will, following the chapter on the fall and all that, uh, the argument is going to be that free will does not yet, does not still exist. We are now in bondage to sin. So this was a unique in, uh, um, situation, historically speaking, that uh, um, Adam had, God made man upright. Ecclesiastes 7.4, um, is Seven, 7.29. God made man upright. He was created righteous, but subject to change. Um, and had the power to fulfill the law of God and to transgress it. So do we have the power to fulfill the law by nature? No, no, we're in bondage to sin. So free will, strictly defined, no longer exists. So we have a whole chapter on that, so we'll discuss that more in more detail. Uh, what is the law that it's talking about? Is, is that specifically the moral law summarized in the Ten Commandments. Not the ceremonial law, not the civil law, the moral law. Uh, all right, where are we? Um, what was man's moral condition at the time of creation? Um, he was created righteous. Um, created man in, with no, knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness. Uh, so when we get to the fall, we're not to imagine the fall takes place because of some defect in Adam. So a temptation is going to arise outside of Adam. That's, that's very important. Humanity was, Adam was created righteous. Eve was created righteous. When they succumb to temptation, the temptation is not something that comes from within as they were created. It will originate outside of them through Satan coming in the form of a serpent. So we're not to think that God somehow um, created a defective Adam. It's not a defect in Adam. Adam was made uh, with the, the possibility of falling into sin. When we look at the fall, we'll get into more details with that as well. Uh, five, of what practical importance is the doctrine of creation? What are some of the applications that you were able to think of? Whereas an exalted view of humanity? Yes. So we would say, certainly in terms of um, our anthropology. So we would say human dignity, um, human responsibility. We are made in an in, in image. We have the power to choose. Um, our obligation to serve God, to, to please God, to honor God. Is, a, is, an, is an offshoot of the doctrine of creation. We are created by God for God. We are 
moral deeds, his law has a claim on us. Uh, yes, because there's one God, there's one moral truth. Morality is not relative. Right and wrong are not personal and subjective. The moral code found in the Bible, such as the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount, is absolute. There's one God. Uh, th theologically, because there is one creator and one God, there's but one religion, truth, one religious truth. Uh, because there's one creator, there's one ultimate reality. Uh, by natural and special relation, God puts us in contact with that reality. Not, not only human dignity, but human responsibility as well. Right, as, uh, as, as image bearers, we are responsible agents, accountable for our actions, rather than vic victims of either nature or nurture. It also gives us comfort that we are not our own, but belong to a creator. Yes, we belong. We yeah. Develop that. Uh, I think both, both in a sense that I, I think about, I'm thinking about how to work, I guess, like question yeah. one of you are not your own. My only comfort in life is yeah. that this uh, not my own, but the long body and soul of the Creator, the one who made me, care with these efforts. But also that, like, you are not your own. Like, you, there's a reality that you don't belong to yourself. So that, that speaks to that. Like, yeah, I think so. I have um, not, not. I don't have uh, every conceivable category in which to discuss these things. But this is my uh, little page of uh, s summary. Uh, but under, under this sort of psychology, uh, ident identity, you, you know, we, right, we are, we are not alone in the universe. Um, who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? These fundamental questions are answered by the doctrine of creation. You know, who am I? Um, I've written a book by that title. Um, who, who we are? Who are, who are we? Um, yeah, who, who am I? What's the, what's, the, what's the title of that book? Uh, who, who, who am I? Uh, you know, I'll let me, little background story on that. I, I wrote that book uh, as part of a Sunday school class. Actually, the Sunday school class way preceded it, and it was in discussions in a Sunday school class. We started talking about identity issues. You know, identity was the big deal. Still kind of is a big deal. And uh, so I was looking at the ways in which we are identified as Christians and talking about those things and keeping every, all the different, you know, we're sinners, but we're saints. You know, we are, um, we are children of God. So we are sons. There was a bunch of S's, you know, sinners, saints, sons. Uh, I can't so that Sunday school so class had so much insight, right? It did, the class, the partis You were there, huh? Yeah, you know, that all started out on a half sheet of paper uh, and then just writing some things up on the blackboard and then we started batting the ball back and forth. Um, and anyway, I got it all together and it was all based on Christian S's, like saints, sinners, and so forth. <laughs> and, and, and then I got the book all written and sent it off to the publisher and they were ready to publish it and then I realized, uh-oh. I'm missing some basic part of our identity, which is creatures. Doesn't start with an S, but we have a created identity. Who are we? We are creatures of God. We are made by God. That is so fundamental. Who am I? I am a human being made in the image, made by God in the image of God. I mean, that is fundamental. That's where we really start the whole discussion. And, and, and then secondly, you know, the fall. I am a, also a sinner. So before we start talking about Christian identity, I need to understand my identity as one made by God and therefore responsible to God and accountable to God, made for God. Uh, and I know why I am here. And uh, um, I know where I came from and why I am here. And as a Christian, I know where I'm going. So those are the absolutely fundamental, never mind identity issues, but philosophical issues, right? Who are we? And why are we here? Well, if you don't have a doctrine of creation, you can't answer those questions. And, and that's why a, a simple Christian with a 90 IQ uh, knows more than the, the most brilliant professor in, in the most uh, you know, elite institution. Because he can answer that question. 
I know who I am and I know why I'm here. Why? Because I understand the doctrine of creation. I know I'm made by God and I'm made to serve God, please God, honor God, bring glory to God. That's what life is all about. And then, and then, you know, and then we build on that uh, as, as we go along. So uh, theologically, crea there, there's one creator. Ethics, there's one moral code. A anthropology, uh, all human beings have dignity. Um, we are all uh, ob ob obligated to serve God and humanity, and we are all accountable to him. And then in terms of psychology, that, that's who I am. I am, I am a, 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 a being made by God. I'm not here by chance. I'm not the product of a, you know, blind forces in the universe operating billions of years, combining matter and energy, and you know, things evolve, and eventually human beings pop out. And so it's a dead universe, and when I die, I go back into the oblivion of which I first emerged. No, we don't, we, we don't live in that kind of a despairing, dark universe. Uh, why? Because we understand we're made by God. It's just so fundamental. And then the gospel, that's where the gospel starts. The gospel starts with creation. I'm made by God, and I'm accountable to him, made for him. Am I accountable? Am I, am I pleasing and honoring him? Uh, so I think... I think that that's, you know, it's four spiritual laws. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That was law number one. No, law number one is God made you and he calls you to obey and serve him. Law number two, you are not doing it. And so you are under condemnation. Law number three, Jesus Christ came to save you from your sin and condemnation and reconcile you to your maker. So, those first two sound an awful lot like mere Christianity. I think Lewis took that from me. <laughs> Look. Yeah, yeah. The, the question number five, practical importance of, of creation. There's, there's, there's other things, too, about our relationship as humans to creation. You know, so often we talk about the, the negative command not to eat of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but there are positive commands that actually precede that. Fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over it. And so our relationship as, you know, what human flourishing looks like is contained in there. Our relationship to the earth's resources. The earth isn't supposed to rule over us, which is what modern environmentalism would have you think. We're supposed to have dominion over it in a responsible manner. But there's, there's a lot about human flourishing that is in the, those first, that first chapter of Genesis as well. Yeah, no, I think we're meant to develop the resources of the earth. I think we're meant to have children. And we're to be fruitful and multiply. And one plus one is not multiplication. That's addition. So, you know, we're meant to multiply. Um, you know, the, the uh, birth rate right now is 1.6 in the U.S. It's lower than that in Western Europe. I mean, you're, you're going to see a demographic catastrophe take place. And it's, it's coming. It's just around the corner. And once it starts, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's almost irreversible. Uh, you lose a generation and you depopulate a whole region. Uh, and it's all part, it's all, you know, we don't talk as much about this, but it's part and parcel of the whole rejection of God, with the moral code of the Christianity, and then the dominion principle. We are meant to develop the earth responsibly, and we are meant to have children and fill it. You say, well, the earth is already filled, it's overpopulated. Do you ever fly from the East Coast to the West Coast? Fly over country? It's empty. <laughs> you know? There's, there's like 100 million people living inside of I-95. It's, uh, you know, we're, we are concentrated on the coasts and the Great Lakes, and then there's a big vacant area across the entire continent. Uh, so It's not totally vacant. There's excellent hunting. Doesn't <laughs> <laughs> like you? There are tremendous creations out there that fly swiftly and taste delicious. Half a mile away from the Great Lakes, Wisconsin is empty. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're from Wisconsin. The no, place is empty. It's the all. The Mississippi River originates right between that and Minnesota. I mean, I'm going to have to take you on a fishing trip or something one of these days, I guess. Did, did I tell you the story about what Augustine said about people that ask? Uh, no. <laughs> all right, let's take a five minute break.